Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Crookcast. If you may have noticed, I didn't do one last week. I took a week off, needed just a little bit of time to, I wanted to sit back and watch everything that was happening and uh, just take a little break. I've also taken a break from social media. I deleted all the social media apps on my phone, um, but I felt that this episode this week was going to be really good. It was going to be really good. Uh, my good friend from high school, Jacob Heemstra, reached out to me and he wanted to do a podcast episode. And I think that we're going to ha- cover a lot of good ground today. So, Jacob, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, as we always do, we're going to go start with uh, introduction. Go, so go ahead and uh, tell everybody about yourself and about your background and uh, okay. what um, led up to making you the bring you where you are today uh so you know uh grew up in uh you know a little rural town jenison um not too much going on um not a whole lot of you know minorities uh in the city um pretty small town um i'm adopted as well so it's that was a little bit different um didn't really didn't really have a whole lot going on in my life i didn't really know you know where i wanted to go in life uh Damn me like crazy goals. Um, you know, I did football all four years. So that kind of driven me, drove me a little bit. Um, and I graduated and, you know, I was kind of like, well, shoot, you know, now I'm kind of stuck. You know, I don't know what I want to do. Um, so then I decided to do MMA for about two and a half years. I competed um, amateur in the state of Michigan. Um, did a pretty good job. I had a record of like nine and three. Um, kept me in shape, you know, kind of gave me a purpose. Um, but you know, you can only do that for so long too. So, you know, I was like, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know what? Um, my brother had just recently, I think he about two years prior, he joined the air force. Um, so I was like, you know, let's, let's try the military, you know, I mean, I've heard nothing but great things about it, you know, the service, um, it's a huge honor. So, you know, I went ahead and took the steps. I was a little bit older, but, you know, I went to the recruiting station and sat down and talked to the recruiter. And he's like, so what do you want to do? And I was like, well, you know, I don't really know. Um, I kind of like law enforcement, you know, been kind of interested in it. And he's like, oh, he's like, I got the perfect job for you. And I was like, yeah, what is that? And he's like, uh, military police. And I was like, okay. I mean, sounds, you know, easy enough. Uh, so, you know. Did the thing, signed the contract, and here we are seven years later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's definitely been a ride. Um, yeah, it's just it's just an honor. Uh, one of the one of the greatest things to be able to do, you know. So, it's cool, man. Well, let's cut into it a little bit. So, football is actually where I met you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I yep. and you. I remember you were on the line. How tall yep. are you? Uh, about five six. You're five six, <laughs> and you were yeah. on the line. And how how heavy were you on the line? Uh, back then, uh, still not about. I think my heaviest was like one seventy. One, yeah. So you're on the line. You got guys that are like two hundred and twenty pounds. You know, <laughs> you're going, you're scrimmaging against. Yep. But you're like so low. You get under their center of gravity, and then you just like <laughs> rage out, and you would just drive these guys out. And I remember that man, and I was like, dang, that's that's imp- that's cool. So I tried to do the same thing. Not. Not as well. I was horrible at football. I was, so, I was so, I was so bad. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, after the second year I stopped playing football and I started working construction. I was like, Oh, I can do this instead. But you continued. What were some things that you learned playing football in high school? Um, just, the the whole team aspect, you know, camaraderie, um, kind of try to work together as a team, um, to, you know, to get kind of the bigger picture done, um, made a lot of good friends, you obviously, um, oh, thanks, just, you man. know, that <laughs> now, you know, just like, you know, that, that fellow, you know, that fellow sense of, you know, team bonding skills, I guess. And, uh, I, I kind of sense a purpose, um, uh, working out, um, uh, stuff like that. So what was that one coach? Do you remember the guy that like, he like taught us to want to kill people when we like hit them so hard it was like sophomore year i was his uh, name i can't uh, i want to say he was this huge dude i think he was coaching line 
Man, Man, it's been name? so long. I can't remember. I know you're talking about. I can picture him. Yeah, he was just yeah. like, I want you to try and hit people so hard that you can. You're trying to make their heart stop, and I'm like, okay. So I like took that to heart. I like made that my ethos. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. <definitely. laughs> and I, I learned to like being aggressive, mm-hmm. which carried on into perfectly into the Marine Corps because as the Marine definitely. Corps like worships aggressiveness. Yeah. So definitely. that was pretty cool. That was a valuable thing that I took out of it. Plus weightlifting, you know, learning mm-hmm. how to weight lift. Yep. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. And a lot definitely. of that, a lot of the, you'll learn a lot of basics about male tribalism and just how, yeah. like how male relationships work on exactly. a team. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Definitely. So, so then you get into MMA. Mm-hmm. MMA was cool, man. That was when it was it was really popular in the West Michigan area. So where'd you train at? Somewhere in Grand Rapids? Uh, so I started out in uh, Grand Rapids uh, MMA. Uh, there's a little ta- uh, little gym, not very big, uh, out in Grand Rapids. Um, was kind of well known, uh, not really. Um, but there was a couple of notable fighters you probably have heard of. Um, so that was like their sister gym. So like they turned out to Detroit, but they would always come down and kind of like, you know, hang out with the coaches. Uh, Darren Cruikshank being one of them. Um, uh, there's a couple other ones I can't remember. Um, but I started out there. Um, you know, I, I uh, we, it was funny how I started actually. You asked, so me and my buddies were at Buffalo Wild Wings for a night, you know, watching the fights. And, you know, we we're just, you know, eating our food or whatever, watching the fights. and. Um, these, these people come over and they're handing out, you know, cards to these amateur fights. And, you know, I get one and, and my friend's like, Hey, you, you know, you, you should think about, you know, trying. I was like, you know what? Yeah. Why not? So, you know, I found this gym, went and trained for like, I think two weeks really was, it was, only, it wasn't a lot of time. It was two weeks. And, uh, there I was my first fight. And I'm two weeks forget. of training. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, t- t- Tell me about that first fight, man, after two weeks of training. What, uh, break it down. What was that like? So, obviously, you know, I knew, I knew a little bit. Um, I mean, I had boxed a little bit before, nothing like crazy. But, I mean, I knew, like, you know, the basics. Um, didn't really wrestle, but, you know, from football, you know, we learned, you know, to get low and stuff like that. Um, so, the training kind of came natural. Um, you know, it wasn't – I mean, there's still a lot I could learn. But in that two weeks, I felt, you know, that I, I'd learned enough to go in. And I remember the night the night that the fights were, I showed up. And I remember just walking in before everyone had gotten there. Because it was over, it was at the Delta Flex. Um, I don't know if you remember. I don't oh, know, I yeah. It's still up. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, That's yeah, a big stadium. Uh, yeah. So I remember showing up before everybody had, you know, gotten there and taking their seats. And I remember looking and the cage was set up. And I've never seen, you know, a cage personally up front or anything. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, holy cow, like what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> so, you know, um, but I think I was like the, the fifth fight or something like that and uh, didn't really know what to expect. Uh, my opponent was, um, he'd had a couple fights. So I think he was like, he's like three or four fights in. So I was like, well, geez, you know, maybe a little bit more nervous too. Um, but Hey, you know, it's all about competition Went in there and competed. Um, I lost unfortunately, but learned a lot of good lessons. So, but it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Very cool. And you're like, so you're like walking up to that cage and you're like, holy <laughs> smokes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tell you, yeah. Seeing it up close, you're just like, geez. <laughs> you ever been in real fights before that? Uh, I, I had not. And, and that's the crazy part is a lot of people, you know, are like, you know, you know, Jake doesn't fight, you know, like he's not, you know, I'm a pretty quiet person. I don't, you know, don't like to start things, you know, and I'm, um, so they're like, oh, you, you know, so no, I, I hadn't, no, mm-mm. nope. So you go to your first fight, mm-hmm. kind of, you're nervous because it's your first fight. What are you, 19? Yeah. Uh, I think it was, I was 21, 21. 21? I just, I like just turned 21. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 21 years old. You go do your first fight, you trained for two weeks. You, uh, <laughs> you get, you lose, you lose. Mm-hmm. So what do you think? What'd you learn from losing? Um, I think just, uh, cause I think that was the first, uh, time, you know, 
individually as an individual sport, you know, I had lost anything because I obviously I competed in high school sports and that's, you know, it's more of a team thing. Um, and I think it just kind of, you know, it made me work harder. Um, it made me, you know, realize, you know, um, if I'm going to commit to something like this, um, I probably should take more time and kind of just, you know, train harder and learn everything that I can about the art. Um, and just try to continue to push myself. So, so you got, you like looked at it and you were like, you had a taste of failure. And out of that, you decided that I'm just going to work harder. Yep. Definitely. Right? Yep. I totally mm -hmm. believe that. Cause I, I could see that in high school, you know, you know, you see that in your character, you're looking <laughs> at these challenges. You wanted to be on the line. Yeah. You know, you wanted to be on the line. You wanted to, you wanted to do the thing because it was hard because it mm -hmm. was difficult and you put your all into it. And I just remember you were, you were kind of an animal in the weight room, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, training with big pen. Yep. Yeah. I remember <laughs> he didn't let you have any slack too. when you guys were training nope. together. No, no, not at all. <laughs> those, those were good days. Those, those good were good days. days. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what did you, so what, What's that transition experience like when you went from losing your first fight, getting into it, working hard, and you started winning? Um, it was it was good. I was starting to feel good. Um, I, then I switched. So I'm switching gyms after like I think like the second or third fight. Um, to one of my buddies. Uh, it was just a little bit closer. Um, and. Eventually, I think I was like on my, I want to say my fourth fight, fifth fight. Um, they're like, hey, you know, the promotion that I was fighting for at the time. Um, they're like, hey, we got a, you know, we got a title fight coming up. Uh, you know, do you, would you like to try? And I talked to my coaches a little bit and, you know, asked what they had thought. And they're like, you know, I think, I think you should go for it. You know, I mean, there's no, you've been doing good. You know, you've been coming in. Um, Cause at the time I was actually, so I was laid off. I, I didn't have, I was jumping from job to job. I wasn't in college. And uh, so I was training like Monday through Friday, I think, or Monday through Saturday. Um, and then I'd rest obviously on Sundays, but it was hard because, you know, like I said, I was, I, I, I was unemployed at the moment. So I was like, well, I, I might as well take this time to, you know, get as much training in as I can. Um, Cause I'm not working, you know, so um yeah, I think I ended up in – yeah, I got a chance to fight for the 135-pound title, and sure enough, got it, so. Dang. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. 135 pounds, so you had to drop, like, 40. So was 135 your normal fighting weight? No, I – so I walked around about – I was about 156 at the time. Um, so I was cutting about 20 or 20-plus 20 pounds every, every fight. Did you wrestle? But, uh, you didn't wrestle, did you? No, I didn't. So that, that was another, so I didn't really feel comfortable because I didn't really know how to cut weight. You know, I, I'd never wrestled in my life. Um, and, and I'm the type of person where I can eat whatever I want, you know, and I, I don't normally, I don't, I don't reap the, the repercussions of it, you know? So, um, that kind of took a little bit getting used to. Um, but the more I did it, uh, the better I got at it. It was just a lot of disciplines. It's very, very, very disciplined, very regimental diet. Um, and, uh, I mean, it worked out every time, you know, I never got sick or anything, did it the right way. So yeah, doing it the right way. <laughs> when you, when you trained, did you do, was it just like an MMA gym or did you do multiple disciplines? Like do you have jujitsu and boxing, some Muay Thai, or is it just straight up MMA training? So you know um, you know what I mean? It was, it, it was just one gym, but uh, they do – so, like, each – they'd have – they had, like, three different coaches. They had they had a wrestling coach, they had a striking coach, and then they had a jiu-jitsu coach. And every day would be something – a little something different. So, like, one day would just, we would just focus on, you know, clinching Muay Thai or whatever jiu-jitsu. We'd just roll for that day. Another day we would just strike. Uh, another day we would just do straight cardio. Um, and then, like, another day we would just do straight uh, um, sparring. And we just kind of see, you know, like, throw everything together and see where we're at. So it was, it was a couple different disciplines. Um, I never got belted. Um, they didn't have belts at the gym. Um, 
But uh, there's just a lot of cool stuff to learn, though. A lot of cool stuff. So. Do you approve of that style of training, the way that they did it? Or do you think that there's a better way to train MMA? Um, me, personally, I, I loved it. I liked it because um, it gave you, like, a whole day's worth of training to kind of concentrate on one aspect, you know? Um, instead of just throw, you know, do this and do that. And it kind of gave you a purpose and direction for that one day. Um, and you could, you could kind of hone those skills. It gave you a better an easier time of honing those because you're working strictly on just that one, um, one discipline. So I, I loved it. What made you hang it up? Did really uh, well. Yeah. Um, it was getting to the point where, you know, um, it wasn't, it was big, but it wasn't super big quite yet. Um, and in the state of Michigan at the time, what, uh, what year was this? I want to say I enlisted in 2013. So I want to say from probably 2012, no, 2000, sorry, 2011 to 2013 to the time that I enlisted in the army. So, um, yeah, I still wasn't very, um, very big in the state of Michigan. It, 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 um, it was everywhere else. Um, it just wasn't in Michigan. It wasn't quite there yet. They weren't having a whole lot of pro shows. Um, so it was getting to the point where, you know, I was doing very good and, um, in the amateur aspect and I was actually about to go pro. Um, it, it was just, there was a lot of underlying my last fight. Um, I don't know what happened, but my, my very last fight that I ever fought before I enlisted in the Army was um, I lost in the second round, and I don't know what happened with that weight cut because normally my weight cuts are, are they're very smooth. But um, that particular one, um, I remember after the fight, you know, I felt really weak, and so I ended up actually going to the, the ER like two days later, and they did some tests and stuff, and they are like, you're pretty close to like kidney failure. Ooh. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah. And that's kind of gave me a scare because I was like, you know, I've never usually been one to maintain my health. Um, mm -hmm. And it just it, it just didn't it wasn't getting me to where I needed to be. You know, I wanted to go to school. Um, I was still struggling on finding, you know, a, a, a job that I could stick to that would pay, you know, decent enough amount. Because, I mean, at this time, I'm about 22, you know, so. Um, and I just didn't have a career either. I didn't have like a career goal, you know, I mean, yeah, fighting is, you know, it's a career. You can make a career out of it, but I just didn't have the means to really make it, you know. So. Makes a lot of sense. And that's the common path with a lot of guys. You know, I think a lot of young men, they get into, whether it's MMA or if it's a strict discipline like boxing, you know, and jujitsu yeah. and a lot of them bite into that and then they just drive hard with it because it, yeah. it fulfills something mm -hmm. it tests you yep. and it teaches you things about yourself and and i think that's so important because you don't stop growing like your brain keeps developing until you're 25 that's when it stops you're still yeah. growing in your personality and who you are and figuring out who you are until you're 25 and the best way to do that is to test your limits and being in yep. being in a sport where it's one on one <laughs> It's a duel with another human being, you know, that's also trained and prepared. That's, that's a big challenge. But the things that you learn from that for preparing for challenges and facing those challenges and being willing to do the work to prepare for it and having the fear of I'm going to get my face smashed in in front of all these people if I don't give it my all yeah. because the yeah. other guy is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Dude, that's, that definitely carries over into and to anything else, the problem is, is when guys see a, a physical health issue and mm -hmm. they don't stop. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys, will, they'll start getting their brain rattled, but they're so hooked on it that they don't quit. And before you know it, you start losing a physical capability. Right? If you had kidney failure, you wouldn't be able to join the army. You wouldn't yeah. be able to be where you are. And then what do you have? You're a broken body. And you can punch things, but you can't punch things anymore, man. That's <laughs> yeah. and that's a dead end. So, I give you props for recognizing the situation and then, and then stepping up and making a pivot in your life. Pivoting is hard. 
yeah. but you but you did it you did it successfully definitely so why the army um so funny story um so uh a long time ago uh actually right when we graduated in 2009 um I went to a recruiter and I was like, hey, you know, I want to join the military. I went to the Air Force uh, recruiter. So we got everything set up. Everything was good to go. I went to MEPS and we got to the part where they're like in the medical place. And they're like, if you if we find out you lie and so and so and yada, 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 you know, yeah. um, we could prosecute you. And me being, you know, young and not really knowing anything, you know, that scared me to death. Like I was like, I don't want to prosecuted you know by the federal government yeah. so uh i i put on that i i had i had asthma on the on the the physical uh at mets uh, and the meps guy saw that and he's like yeah man sorry we gotta we gotta cut you loose so that didn't work out and uh so then you know i took a break a couple of years in between that's when i was doing you know my mma and everything and then it popped up again and i was like well you know what? I haven't tried any other branches. So I went to the another recruiting office in Wyoming and I talked to, um, I actually funny, I originally wanted to join the Marine Corps. Um, and, uh, they, I came in and they were like, okay, you know, and then they saw that I had, uh, I had tattoos on my forearms. So it's like a, a uh, big, big no go for, yeah, the Marine oh, Corps. Oh, in those, uh, in those years, if it had been 2009, they would have shooed you in. Cause man, yeah. they had the Marine Corps had done this thing where they had lowered their standards super low, mm -hmm. so they were letting people as fab waivers come in. <laughs> they were like, it was so like when I was joining, we had this wave of like super dumb dudes coming in. <laughs> man, it was they were they were letting anybody in, but then afterwards, you know, they started tightening up the numbers, and they were yeah. they were not letting guys reenlist for tattoos. Yeah, no, it was. Studs. It was. A, I think that was all across the board too, because uh, I actually had. So then, so the Marine Corps didn't work out. Obviously, I couldn't join the Air Force. So my next, uh, I actually, I think one of the Army guys had heard because they, their offices are right across the hall. So I was about to leave, you know, and Army guys like, "Hey, you know, come in here." So I'm like, "Okay, cool." So I sit down, and you know, we get to talk or whatever, and he's like, "So I was telling him everything, you know, how I got kicked out of the, the I couldn't do Air Force, and then I." Obviously, I told him about the Marine Corps, and he's like, oh, he's like, well, he's like, since asthma's, you know, already on your record, he's like, you don't have to worry about that because there is a way in. It's just going to take a little bit longer, but he's like, we can get you in. So I was like, okay, you know, did that. So it, it, it took the the initial process took a little bit longer because um, I had to get a waiver. I had to go to my doctors and, you know, show that my asthma doesn't affect, you know, my, my you know, anything about me or anything. And then um he said the waivers you could get tattoos for waivers so they went ahead and did that and so i got in um cool so, savvy yeah. recruiter knows the system yes get, get you in. <laughs> yep <laughs> well there's a will there's a way <laughs> yeah so you join the army you go mp right you signed up for military police like you said earlier that was something that yep. was very interesting to you were you thinking about career path then Oh, uh, at that point, yes, I was, um, you know, I thought, you know, it'd be kind of a good, um, to get a head, a, you know, a foot in, um, in law enforcement for, if I do decide, if I don't decide to make, you know, the military a career or, you know, at least I have somewhat of training because the thing about, so, uh, military police, uh, our MOS, uh, your first contract is a five-year contract. So a lot of other army MOSs, uh, they're only three years. So. Um, I was like, shoot, that gives me plenty of time, you know, five years, you know, law enforcement experience, you know, why not? That'll set me up for, you know, the future. So yeah, at that point, yeah, I definitely was. Um, hmm. Do that. How was boot camp? You're a little uh, older. Actually, You're a little yeah, older. Are you going to I, boot camp? I was, yeah, I was 22. Um, it really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't. Did you have the card thing or is that just a rumor? You know what I'm talking about? The red card yeah, and the yellow card yeah, and the yeah. going home on the weekends. Did you get those yeah, things? So I, yeah. So I did not have the, the card. Um, that, I think that they started that about three years ago. I want to say, yeah. um, Do they still do it or is that just a rumor? Like something yeah, they tried no, out. 
It's still. Uh, I talked to one of my one of my old squad leaders. He's a drill uh, now, and uh, he said, "No, nah, it's a real thing. It's the stress cards, is what they are. They're called stress cards." Stress cards. Um, yeah, um, it's times are changing, man. From from when I came in to and and, and to me also, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, I, I'm I'm not gonna say they didn't like you know the drill sergeants. They didn't like beat on you or anything like that. I mean, um, I mean they cuss at you and yell at you every now and then, but that's part of the system. I mean, you know that, you know, mm-hmm. um, break you down and, you know, you're supposed to build yourself back up. Um, so it really wasn't that bad. Um, I, my, my battle was, was, was an awesome dude. Um, we still, we still talk, um, even after, I mean, it's been forever since we seen each other and we still talk. Um, it was definitely an eye opening experience. Um, I'm kind of glad you brought it up too. Um, I don't mean to, go into another topic but i'll just i'll kind of i'll kind of go off of that so go in um do it so with everything that's going on in the world obviously you know um a lot of bad stuff you know people are accusing people of racism and this and that and don't get me wrong racist does exist racism does exist i've seen it firsthand i've experienced it um but when i so when i the first day the very first day you get to basic right the drill sergeants, they sit you down and they, you know, you just tell them facts about, you know, I was either you lived in the city or the country, uh, what your religion is, um, your race, um, stuff like that. And they will on purpose make your battle buddy the total opposite of what you are. Ah. So like, yeah. And you have to, that whole what, time you have to get what's to What's a battle buddy? Uh, so, so battle buddy. So that's the person that is designated the whole time during your basic training. Um, he is your, um, basically your friend, your, um, he, everything he does, you do everything you do. He does. Um, if he gets in trouble, you get in trouble Ah, and vice versa. Military issued friendship. Pretty much, pretty much like they (laughs) make you. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of indoctrinated. Um, and I, I hate to use that word, but it's, it's true is it's kind of indoctrinated into you. Um, there is no, there is no race in the army. We all, I mean, there is. But we all we all bleed the same. We're all part of one team, which is the army team, the green. You know, um, that's just kind of how it is. And so that was a huge wake up call when I enlisted because I mean, who was your I battle? Never, hmm? Who was your battle buddy then? Like, who's your Who, opposite? Yeah. Who was my opposite? So he was from the city. I believe he was from Denver, Colorado. Uh, pretty big, bigger than Jenison, Michigan. So um, <laughs> he was. Yeah, he was. He was white, um, but there were some things that were in kind of in common too. Like, and that's the other thing. Like, as basic went on, we kind of found that you know we actually, as much as we were different, we had a lot of common things uh, that were the, that we liked the same too. Like the same kind of music, you know, um, same kind of bands, same kind of you know uh, hobbies, stuff like that. So it, it is pretty cool, you know. It's it's cool to you know experience that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is something that I tell people too. And my experience in the Marine Corps, well, you know, because I grew up in Jenison too. You know, and mm-hmm. Jenison, I'm white, obviously, and Jenison <laughs> is predominantly white, like mm-hmm. ridiculously white. <laughs> it's it's a descendant Dutch neighborhood. It's mm-hmm. super middle class, very conservative. I. The yeah. one of the streets in the town breaks the record for the number of streets on one or another number of churches on one street. It's in the yep. Guinness Book of World Records. It's Baldwin, mm-hmm. I think, right? Yep. Yeah, Baldwin. Baldwin. Yep. <laughs> it's so it's very it's very bland. It's mm-hmm. it's a very same taste across the board. <laughs> so when you go into it, then you go into the military and it's just this hosh posh of all these guys. Mm-hmm. You know. I remember I had a couple of friends. I made friends that were Latino that had like a gang background. You know, yep. I made friends that were from black inner city. And I remember I, cause on, you know, we deployed together and I remember talking to him Williams. And I remember like asking him things about like, like terms and things that he would understand. I'd be like, yo dude, what does it mean when somebody says they're thirsty? Like I asked him that because I didn't know. <laughs> so I got to like build these friendships and these bonds with these guys that are 
They're so different than you. Mm-hmm. However, there's still separate. There's still separation in the military. You still yep. judge people, but the mm-hmm. way that you judge people is not like it's not like it is. You know, here mm-hmm. it's is that dude a dirtbag? How good at his job is he? If we go to war, is he going to make me more likely to survive or less likely? Is he a good yep. leader? Does he work out? Is he a fat turd who drops out of hikes and I have to carry his backpack because he can't do it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. These are the things for which you are judged. You're judged at how good of a trooper you actually are, what yep. your worth is to the tribe, mm-hmm. which is terrific because it encourages yep. people to be better and it holds people accountable and it's way better than judging Definitely. people based off of something superficial, you know? Yep. Mm-hmm. So that is in light of the situation in, in our nation right now. And if you're listening in the future, uh, the George Floyd riots have happened recently, you know, demonstrations all over my own city of Grand Rapids had a riot. And it was the first time, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of gentlemen said, this is the first time they've seen any rioting and property damage like this. And it's, in like 60 years like crazy this is this is unprecedented for this to happen in grand rapids mm-hmm. and it really it really says a lot of things and i think a lot of people are talking about you know they talk about black lives matter or all lives matter or whatever thing you want to chant but everybody's saying we need to be more inclusive and less diverse mm-hmm. and i just had a conversation with my wife by the way who is korean and we just had a conversation about this uh, at dinner today if you really want to make a difference, the best way you can make a difference is you go make a friend that's different than you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because it's not just skin color. Like that's it's a superficial thing. There is more than that. There's cultural differences, right? There's the Definitely. way that the interests, the way people spend money, well, music they listen to, what their past yeah. experiences are like, what's what human experiences have built their humanity and built their image of themselves today. Likely if you're a human being, your friends are going to be a lot like you. They're probably going to look like you and they're probably going to be interested in the same things as you. Cause that's how we build friendships. I challenge anybody that's listening. If you really want to make a difference in the culture today and to make people treat people differently, go purposely make a friend that's different than you right guys like me and jacob we've had these experiences most military guys have Mm -hmm. because you're forced to be friends with people way different than you so i I challenge that to even political party dang dude i'll say it go make friends with somebody that's politically different than you get out of your bubble and ask them why they think about the things that they do and it's probably going to be different than what you think and what you've painted them to be like. And you can have those discussions. What you'll probably find about is that everybody through whatever their perception is, cares about people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The way they execute that is in different ways, but we all have families. We all care about people and we're all trying to live life and life is hard. And you can find commonality in that, if nothing else. I think so to hit on that kind of what you said, Carson, too, is um, so you're saying, you know, a person's heart, like you said, it has nothing to do with the color of their skin or, you know, where they come from, what religion they are. That has nothing to do with a person's heart. So a lot of times, like you were saying, you know, we're kind of forced to be put in situations where for instance like you deployed you know your life was in danger um you see that in your fellow you know your fellow brother or your fellow sister um that's kind of that's that's the thing like it's almost it's it sucks to say but you you almost have to be forced into that position to really see you know and open your eyes and like oh you know and it, it sucks because the world now we've been so drawn into you know um that world you know we haven't really sat back and been like you know what despite that person's skin color if me and him or me or her 
were to go to a war zone or be put in a, you know, serious life or death matter, you know, would they lay their, their life down for me? Would I lay their life down for them? You know, and can that's I something tr- that- Can I trust them? Yeah, exactly. Can I trust yep. them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it, man. And I think, I think you need to, you want to break it down more than that. You can. I remember talking to Afghans, locals, you know, because we were working with Afghan Army, Afghan National Police. A lot of those guys, pretty, pretty turdy. A lot of them, yes. a lot of them are like 25 years old, and all mm-hmm. they do is smoke dope and get drunk. And they don't really want to be there. And you just look at them, you're like, man, but some of those guys, I remember there was one, we called him Mario, right? Mm. He was like 40 years old and he had this big Mario mustache (laughs) and he would wear this leather jacket. So, and he was, he was Afghan national police. I remember talking to him through an interpreter and uh, we always liked him because he was always composed when the younger guys were like goofing off. But this dude is like, you know, he's, he acts like a man when the rest of his yes. unit are a bunch of boys. Mm-hmm. And so we all liked him. And we asked him, you know, what his story was. And he said that his son was killed by Taliban. And so he joined the Afghan National Police because mm-hmm. he wanted to serve. It's mm-hmm. like, dude, that's so cool. So that and that resonated a lot. Yeah. And a lot of these guys sit down, have have chai with them. You didn't like a lot of them, but there was a lot you did like, too. <laughs> You know, I'm for the same reasons, because you judge people based off of what they contributed. Can you mm-hmm. trust them? Yep. And, you know, you make friends with some of them. I look at. I look at what's going on in the United States and people are dividing into factions now. It was black. It was very two sided. But now everybody's it's deteriorated into factions, mm-hmm. the rioters, the looters, the Black Lives Matter group. The, this section of liberalism, this section of conservatism, blue lives matter, like everybody's divided into factions. And then within those factions and within those groups, you have a lot of different voices, right? You need to break it down more. You can't just judge people by what group they're or what team they're on or what faction they're in. Yeah, You need to make it more simple when you look at people and you decide how you're going to interact with them. It's good and evil. Mm-hmm. It's good and evil. There's good and evil in every tribe. There's people that want to promote good and do good. And there's people that want to promote bad and do bad. I saw it even in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. These huge common goal. You're deployed. Stakes are high. Some people do not have good in their heart. Maybe because of circumstance. Few people are actually evil. Mm -hmm. Few people in the world are actually evil. Yeah. Um, Most people you can... If they have some darkness in their heart, you can bring them around by showing good and being the good in their life. Yeah. At the same time, well, my first point, we need to be proponents of good into the world. Mm-hmm. Whatever faction you're in, you need to you need to be good and you need to be a good light. And you need to do that across factions too. Yeah. And at the same time, we need to be guarded because... Not everybody is good, right? Uh, Just true. Mm-hmm. I'll explain this in this way. So I don't know how many people there are in the city of Grand Rapids. Let's say that there's 500,000, right? So you take 100 people and you line them up. And you line them up based off of their morality. So like the most evil person and the most good person, right? Mm-hmm. And so what is evil? Evil is doing the wrong things. like things that hurt other people like bad things knowing that they're bad and not even and just doing it because it is bad because it is wrong that is evil right just doing it destruction and chaos for the sake of destruction and chaos not even to self-propel yourself right yeah because that's being greedy and that's (laughs) that's that's a bunch of other things but when you're just when you're just doing it for the sake of the horror that it causes that's Mm. pure evil so you line people up so you might get a pretty bad person out of that group, that one out of a hundred that's evil. Now take one out of, line them up a hundred thousand people. What is your most evil human being out of a hundred thousand people? <laughs> Probably a pretty bad guy, right? Mm-hmm. So you take like five of those guys, or you get twenty like really 
evil people and then you stick out a riot situation, right? And they're going out and they're looting whatever faction or whatever thing they're associated with. They may be spread out among those different mm-hmm. groups, but they're going to want to reap and sow chaos and destruction. Yeah. So I guess my point is, is be the good proponent of good in the world and keep your eyes open for those individuals that are evil. And it's very few. There's very few people like that. Whatever Definitely. tribe or faction they're in. But Definitely. They do exist. They do. It's proven. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Yep. Let's talk about... A, a big part of this is police, police, policing. Mm-hmm. Why don't you talk about your experience in military police and how you think it is similar and different from civilian police? Um, okay. So obviously, you know, we, we police, um, the, the post, right. We don't go outside of the post. Sometimes we do, you know, if they, if local law enforcement, they need the help or whatever, but a lot of the times it's just, uh, we enforce, um, uh, laws and stuff on a military installation. So kind of the same aspect, you know, you still have, um, you know, speed enforcement, stuff like that. There's still, believe it or not, there still does crime does happen on military installations. Um, you know, theft, um, uh, domestics, you know, murder, even yes, murder, Mm. um, it happens. Um, so a lot of that kind of is the same aspect. Uh, we see the same, crime as civilians do civilian law enforcement just not as much it's not as apparent um and i think can it be more drastic though because you don't uh, have you don't have like homeless people on base you know you don't have a ton of addicts and stuff but you have young men ptsd mm -hmm. yeah uh, weapons training can Mm -hmm. it be more violent it can be. It can be a little bit more on edge, a little bit more dangerous. Um, just because. Is it like that Tom Cruise movie, where he's like, <laughs> where he's like, the difference between me and you is that, what does what does he say? Everybody that I catch is a trained <laughs> killer. Yeah, I mean, you're not hundred percent wrong. I mean, because for instance, so like here in Washington, right, um, on JBLM. I have, we have uh, a ranger, we have a ranger battalion here. And then we also have first group, which is a first group special forces. Oh, yeah. um, so a lot of those guys and their compounds are here too, but they live, I mean, they live, some of them live on post too. So a lot of these guys, I mean, they, they've had years and years of training. They are very proficient in their firearms. So let's just say if, you know, one speeding one day and I decided to do a traffic stop on them and they're just not having a good day. You know, nine times out of 10, they probably have some kind of firearm on them. Like that's, uh, that's a given. Um, so we're a little bit more edgy when it comes to that, just because they know what they're doing, but then also at the same time, it kind of makes you feel a little bit more comfortable too, because they are a lot less more military members are a lot less more to act. Um, if that makes sense, Mm. then like, you know, the civilian populace, they don't, because they know that not only can they get charged on the military side, either they can get charged on the um, civilian side as well. They can Mm. get charged dual. So they kind of, they calm down a little bit. um, But definitely, definitely, there are definitely same and different protocol um, protocols. Um, You know, we're still, we still learn, um, you know, your regular, you know, SFSTs, uh, stuff like that, traffic stops. Um, I mean, you name it, investigations. I mean, shoot, I just did, I almost had to go to court recently for a uh, soldier. Um, he decided to uh, go around the barracks, his barracks room, and start firing off shots. Oh, sweet. We, yeah, we, we caught him <laughs> and uh, they're going to take him to court and they're going to do this whole thing, but he, he ended up doing it, taking a plea deal. So I didn't have to go to court for that one. Mm. Um, but there's there's definitely, yeah, it's definitely still a crazy, crazy job. We still work. I mean, one shift is like nine hours long, and that's not including casework. Mm. Um, so some days it's quiet. Some days it's just crazy. We deal with traffic accidents, all kinds, you name it. Yeah. So. Do, you, do you guys, so you're, 
you're up in Washington, so you guys get like crazy typhoons or anything like that up there, like any crazy storms? Um, we haven't had any storms. Um, there was um so any, a couple years anything back. Anything that would anything that would shut down the base. So they yeah, a couple years back they had in Seattle, um, they had that train derailment that like killed a bunch oh. of people. Oh yeah. Yeah, killed killed a lot of people. Um they ended up they took my brigade, um, all the MPs from my brigade were on call, and they we basically came in and assisted um, local law enforcement and stuff like that. Um, they brought a lot of the, the the hurt people over to the hospital here on post because um, Seattle was getting over overflowed. Um, so that's like the only big thing that I've heard happening in the last couple of years that like shut down post completely. Um, I mean, you have. Yeah, Mount St. Helens, that was, you know, forever ago. I'm not too sure if, like, that affected JBLM or anything, but, mm. yeah. So. Yeah, that's because when everybody is locked down, you guys are still out working, right? Correct, you're, yeah, you're even, first yeah even, yep, even with this whole, you know, when they did the COVID-19 happen, um, we were still pretty much all opposed to, I would, well, yeah, it was shut down. Basically, um, we were still, you know, out there working. Um, they had the obviously had the safe protocol, you know, uh, but yeah, we were still out there working. So, I remember when we when I was in Camp Lejeune, we had a crazy hurricane. It was mm -hmm. like my first. It was like I was I had been in the in the battalion, my infantry battalion, for just a few weeks. So I was still a brand new guy. Yeah, and we had this crazy hurricane camp come in. And so we had time to prepare for it. Like they, they boarded us up and we had pallets of MREs available and tons of water and the power mm -hmm. went out, but the whole base had bought the liquor store dry <laughs> and everybody was boozed up. So we had the craziest party that I have ever seen in my entire life. We had a, we had a, the hurricane party and Two nine was out. They were doing a barracks brawl with one nine. So it was like Braveheart style, like a couple hundred guys like crashing into each other and fighting out in the lawn. And, and uh, there's guys doing dumb stuff, man. There's guy, <laughs> there's a dude like canoeing around because it was starting to flood. He was in his canoe. They're like jumping off like balconies, like trying to parachute with their tarps and stuff. So yeah. the cops show up, right? The MPs roll up. And so the snipers were running around in their silkies and they had their flax on with like whiskey bottles and stuff. Well, they uh, were okay. shooting fireworks at the cops and then running away <laughs> into the tree line. <laughs> mm. So they're like, they're like shooting bottle rockets and stuff at the MPs and they're leaving. And so they kept doing this little gorilla thing. And eventually the MPs just left. Like, we're not even going to try and contain this yep. mass chaos that's here. <laughs> that was, that was a, that was a good time. That was a good time. But it was just funny that like, they just left us to our anarchy. Yeah. <laughs> so the big thing I, I would say too, I, I, maybe it's hit more on, I can't really speak for civilian law enforcement because I've obviously I've never worked civilian law enforcement, but a big thing that uh, our provost marshal, which he's the guy that's like in charge of all the law enforcement here on post is he puts out uh, before guard mount every day, which like guard mount is like our, before shift, they put out everything that's happened for the day and like what's going on, anything like crazy happening. He puts out, so community policing, he's very big on community policing. We show, so there's there's nine sectors, uh, so nine patrols occasionally on JBLM. So nine patrol cars and each, each patrol has their own area that they patrol. So like area three, which is the one I usually do is, uh, there's housing, there's a lot of housing, um, the general's house is actually in that area as well. So he hits big on, we do a lot of, you know, walking patrols. Um, we'll get out of our cars, you know, walk the neighborhood. Um, if it's a nice day out, I mean, we'll, you know, stop at a park or whatever, you know, play with some, you know, play with the kids for a little bit on the, on the, uh, on the, the swing set or whatever. Um, but he's very big on police, on, on, on community police, um, because he feels, which is, it's true. Um, the more we community police, the more that people will feel comfortable coming to us about crimes that are being committed. You know, mm -hmm. we're not out there, you know, to be feared or scared of, you know, that's not, that's not our job. You know, we don't, we don't, at the end of the day, I don't like arresting anybody. I don't like giving tickets to anybody. I really don't. 
In fact, I don't really give out a whole lot of tickets, but even when I have to make an arrest, you know, I try to make the situation a, a really bad situation the best outcome as I can. Um, because we all know, I mean, we're all human. We all make mistakes, you know, um, and it goes back to kind of that, that brotherhood too. Um, at the end of the day, like, yeah, this dude committed a crime. It was, you know, it could have been petty. It could have been heinous, whatever. But at the end of the day, they're still a soldier, you know, um, we're not yeah. gonna, you know, we're not going to hammer them down or, you know, make them feel. Cause I mean, most of the people that we see when we do have to, you know, respond, it's like probably like their worst day they're having ever. And so it's just, it's just one of those things. Um, you hate to see it. Um, but so, That's but yeah, good. community policing is definitely, yeah, it's definitely a big part of it. Um, I think that, um, so I actually had a, a friend of mine, me and a buddy of mine were talking. So we're on, we're on gates right now is our, our detail where, uh, our platoon is, um, we man the gates, all the entrances to the, 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 uh, the, the post. Um, so we just got off yesterday and we were kind of having a conversation in the parking lot. And uh, he's, he's from inner city, uh, St. Louis. Um, so he kind of, you know, me and him have kind of a different viewpoint on as far as like, you know, these, these protests going on and stuff like that. But um, mm. he asked me, he's like, so what, you know, what would you, I guess, what would you do if, you know, do you think there needs to be some kind of a reform? And, and, I, and I'll be honest, I, I do think that the justice system um, and law enforcement, there does need to be some kind of a reform. Um, there definitely has to be a switch up of how we do things. Um, it's apparent. Um, for instance, I know most uh, police departments, their academies are only six months long. That's to me, that's not enough training. That It just isn't. I mean, a lot of the training you learn on the job but I mean, you got to think you have a lot of power as a, as a police officer, you know, as a peace officer, you know, you carry a gun. I mean, you know, you enforce laws. That's, that's a lot of power. Yeah. Um, and just to me, six months is not worth, is not a, enough training. I think that there should be a reform on the training aspect. I think that they should teach officers um, how to respond to certain situations. For instance, um, like we, get taught i don't know about the civilian side but here we get taught like how to deal with um special needs kids like autistic kids stuff like that because mm. you know they 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 have fits too and it's and it's you just kind of have to know how to handle it you know um you can't there's a certain way you got to handle the situation you can't just be you know forceful every time so i, I do think there has to be um some kind of a reform um now not bashing you know, law enforcement by any means, because obviously, you know, I, I'm, I'm in law enforcement, but there definitely needs to be some kind of a change, whether that be, you know, they have, they mandate, you know, a, a, a community, um, a community day, you know, where the, the law enforcement officers just one day is committed, which I know is, is kind of hard to, you know, figure out, but just try to figure out a way where they're more involved with their community. And I know there are some police officers that are, they, they are, but the problem is, is the media they don't you know they don't focus on that so the media are uh, the people definitely yeah right mm -hmm. nobody it's very few people are doing facebook live for the you know the police officer that's playing basketball <laughs> with yeah. the neighborhood mm -hmm. kids uh it's always like some really aggressive looking arrest right yes. that's the thing mm -hmm. and so you get this perception i i think that there's we're talking about police reform right mm -hmm. i think there's two two things. So you talked about increasing the budget, increasing the training. And that's super big, right? I also agree. Police do not get enough training. The job is much more technical than it was 30 years ago. There's yeah, so much definitely. more to it now. It's it's so precise. It's so mm -hmm. much more precise than and the world is more complicated and deeper than it was, you know, 30, 40 yep. years ago. And I think part of it, and we can see this in, in my community and in my city, is that with all of the anti-police culture, less people want to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so you have slim pickings. There's yep. a lot of undermanned police departments around mm -hmm. here. 
And so that it almost gets to the point where they're like, they have to take what they can get. You know, they still have yeah. hiring standards, but standards could be higher if more people wanted the job. Yep. Definitely not wrong. Yep. And I think, and I hope that post these riots, that there will be an uptick in people who want to make a positive impact on their community. Right. There's exactly. a lot of, there's a lot of smart and capable people out there and they could go into other job fields, you know, they can go mm-hmm. sales, they can, they can do whatever, but I'm hoping more people choose to be going to law enforcement because they're like, I want to do the job and I want to do it really well. And I want to have yeah. a positive impact to my community. And that's, that's, that's who that's, that's really who I guess the, the police force should consist of. Um, I mean, and that's one thing that I had brought up. Um, I had a conversation with somebody and, you know, they're like, oh, you know, they, they, you know, these people have every right to protest, which is true. You know, first amendment, I agree. Like I, I, you know, these, these every right to protest, you have every right to be angry too. But here's the thing. Protesting only gets you so far. And if you want to do it the right way, why not go into that job field, like you said, and make that difference, you know, because you can make that difference. If enough people were, if enough people were to do that and start, you know, cause everyone's like, Oh, well, you know, police officers don't police their own. Well, then you be the example, you know, and then maybe hopefully more people will follow you and more people and more people. And eventually, you know, the good outweighs the bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's how we change culture. You got to be countercultural, right? Yep. And who makes up the police officers anyway? The community. Yep. Right. It's the community that, you know, people may cross counties or whatever, but for the most part, police officers are from that near area. Yep. Mm-hmm. They're a reflection of the community. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And then more, it's a service and it's a hard job. Mm-hmm. And more people should step up and do it. Yeah. And there's another point to it too. From my perspective, in because I'm involved in these like veteran and first responder nonprofits, right? They focus on mental health. A lot of it is to prevent suicide, but a lot of it is reconstruction of your lives after PTSD events, a big portion of it. And what I see, what I've, what I've learned, man, because I talked to all, a bunch of guys, you know, a lot of veterans, but also first responders, you know, that and what the job is like, because the way the trauma works is that you can have a single traumatic event and you'll have PTSD. By the way, PTSD is like not just a, a, a mental injury, it is a physical injury. That's what they found with Dakota Meyer. He talked about it when he was on the job. Um, when he was on Joe Rogan, how he went and he got a CT scan in his brain. And you can actually see on a CT scan when people have PTSD, because when they get to a certain section, you can see this diamond shape uh, show up on the CT scan. It's a physical injury to your brain, and it takes a long time to fix that. But you can. But So you can have a single traumatic event like Dakota Meyer. You can watch all your friends die, and you can smash a dude in the face with a rock. And t- right? Um, So you can have a single traumatic event, but you can also have many small traumatic events that add up, which is exactly what you find with paramedics, firefighters, police officers. People get assaulted. They get in buildings that are on fire. People die and it's their fault. You know, I met paramedics who made mistakes in the first like few weeks of their career that killed people. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine? I... Um, and yet they have to keep doing the job because that's their career. So what do you do? Well, there's the old, old school idea is resilience, but resilience only gets you so far. And I, I see this at this, at this nonprofit, right? The Johnson Brower foundation and resilience only gets you so far. It works until it doesn't. And then what ends up happening is you end up finding ways to cope. Right. So you start, you drink, you start drinking more, right? You start drinking when you're happy. You start drinking when you're sad. You start, so you start drinking more. Um, you know, you start, a lot of guys take on resilience. So they make themselves numb. Right. 
you make yourself numb at the job and you, it's all procedure and you're like, it's just a job. I just got to show up. You just start cutting off your emotions. Um, but then you start having a hard time turning them back on when you get home. So your, your family life starts to suffer. You start to disconnect from your loved ones. Your marriage starts to suffer. You go through a divorce. You have to rebuild that. And all these things, man, they crumble into your life and they eat away at it and they eat away at you, but you still got to do the job. So what kind of a person are you then by the end of your career? You're completely consumed by this, this hard, hard life, but you can't stop. You're like 10, 12 years into the job. What are you going to do? Going to quit? You can't hit, you don't even have retirement yet. What are you going to go do after that? You don't have, you don't have applicable skills that are going to, you know, get you an equal pay job. So you have to stick it out. You have to do it for retirement. And it's wrong. And so a lot of these guys and they continue to get put in these situations and just it eats them alive as a person. I think you hit a really good uh point. Um so case in point, um, I'll get a little a little personal. Um, so about probably six months ago, um, we got a call. I was actually OJ Teen, my soldier actually. He was uh, which OJ Teen is basically so like they ride around with you and they you learn they learn from you um, for the day, um, like all the areas and. But anyways, yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting at a gate, um, you know, just chit chatting or whatever. And call comes across the radio, um, suicide and we're like, okay, you know, was, that's a common uh, suicidal ideations is a common thing here in JBLM, unfortunately, because yeah, because of the weather and just, yeah. Um, so, you know, I didn't, we didn't think anything of it. We're like, okay. So, you know, we get ready. Um, I get, you know, where the address is and everything. And I'm waiting for her to finish, uh, I'm waiting for dispatch to finish the call, you know, suicidal ideations. She stopped at suicide and I was like, okay. And then she finished and then she was, uh, she said, um, completed. And I was like, oh man. And this was granted, this was my first one since I've been here. Um, I've been, I've seen, I've been in multiple, like probably four or five, but this was my first one here. Um, so we get out there, this granted, this is on a Thursday. It's at like three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's not, you know, it's not your typical, you know, late at night, you know, you would think, um, no, three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, work day. Um, so we get out there, we get on scene. We're the first ones on scene. So me and me and my buddy, um, you know, we, we get out of the car, we approach, um, that happened outside and the, the, uh, the civilians, the guys who work on the generators, um, they're actually the ones who found him. And so their car was kind of parked like on a hill or whatever. And I thought, you know, my first instinct was, well, you know, I didn't know that was their car because they drive civilian cars or trucks or whatever. So, you know, I'm walking up to the truck and the civilian dude is like, he starts pointing and I'm like, what? And he starts, he points again. And so I'm like, okay. So I look over to my left and there's the guy right there underneath the tree um he was gone he 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 he'd been perished for i uh, i think about probably an hour um so finally by then um you know EMS shows up the fire department um everybody shows up and we just start securing the scene you know um my uh my uh, boss shows up uh, she assesses the situation, everything. We start getting um, like uh, witnesses, stuff like that, like what they've seen. And um, I noticed that there's a little, probably about I don't know, 10 meters from the guy. Uh, there's a little like piece of something. I'm not sure what it is, but it's red. And so, you know, I get a little bit closer and then I notice, you know, uh, it's actually, it's, it's a piece of skull. It's a skull fragment. Um, so that that actually this this one had been my first gunshot um, suicide. All the other ones have been had been like uh, you know like a overdose or you know hanging something like that. Um, this was my actually my first uh, gunshot one, which was very very um, graphic. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, I showed up on scene and I and I was numb. But then I, I had to wake up because you know I had a job to do. I had to make sure I had to get 
you know, all the witnesses' statements and stuff like that. So we sat on scene for about probably the whole day, really, the rest of the day. Um, we were there from 3 to about 10 o'clock at night um, when uh, CID was done doing their investigation because CID shows up whenever there's a body to make sure it's not like a, you know, a, a, a murder or anything. Um, so it had been pretty late. Um, we show up at the back at the PMO. We're ready to go home, whatever. And my boss comes up and she's like, "Hey, uh, they want to they want to debrief you real quick." And I'm like, "Okay." So they bring me into this room, or whatever. And it's it's three it's a three guys, um, and they just sit me down and they're you know like, "Okay, you know what did you see? Um, how did you feel?" Um, and they're like, "You know, are you okay?" And I, they're trained, and I guess these guys take an actual class where they're trained in um, like trauma. Um, mm. so like they, they, they help people who've been in traumatic instances and stuff like that. Um, and they're actually two of them were MPs themselves too. Um, they're just a little bit higher up on the, on the, on the echelon, uh, higher ranking scale. But so I talked to him that night, you know, I was like, yeah, everything's good. You know, like, you know, this is my first one, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm used to it. And they're like, okay, we just want to make sure you're okay. So I get home that night. Um, I, you know, I talked to my wife, whatever. Um, we're in bed by then. It's probably like 11. Um, and I, I couldn't go to sleep. I just could not, I could not go to sleep. Um, from the images in my head, I was like, I don't, you know, want to relive that because they're, they're pretty, pretty, pretty nasty. Um, so I was like, okay, whatever. And then the next day I go into work, you know, work patrol, nothing crazy happens. Um, but what I was finding was that, um, in my mind, you know, I thought, Hey, you know, I've been on the job for seven and a half years. I've seen, this isn't my first one, you know, like I'm good. Um, but I wasn't noticing, but my wife was noticing that I was becoming more distant. Um, I wasn't talking as much. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was, I was, I was, I was drinking to the point where like I was abusing. But I was drinking a lot more than what I, I usually do because I don't really drink a whole lot. Um, and uh, I just I didn't notice it personally. I didn't do like a self-reflection, you know, and my wife, my wife finally, you know, sat me down and was like, hey, you know, you need to go get some, you know, you, you, need, you need to talk to somebody basically, you know, like really like sit down and, you know, kind of decompress. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that really helped. I did go and get counseling. Um, it wasn't anything like crazy. Um, a lot of people, you know, my, my chain of command supported it. Um, uh, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't like, you know, berate me or be like, you know, this dude's crazy, you know, he needs, you know, um, but it, it definitely, it definitely helped, uh, definitely helped decompress. And there was this feeling of, like you said, um, so we were in that area, um, actually, around the time probably like he was walking around in the area so my first thought was you know what could i have done to stop this dude because you know we were in the area you know we may or may not have seen him i don't know why did i not see him you know mm -hmm. um so that kind of goes through your head too and uh they kind of had to like you know talk me down and and be like look like it's not your fault you know like people who who have those those kind of things going on in their life and and have that idea they're gonna, they're gonna do it. Like they're gonna, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna find a way, a means to do it. Um, it's not by any means your fault. You know, you just kind of got the after effects. It sucks, but, um, but that's definitely a big, big like you said because now, because what would have happened if, like you said, you know, I'm seven and a half years in. I don't really have. I mean, I kind of have a retirement, but not really. I mean, that's not really. So if I was to just, you know call it quits because of something like that because i didn't get the proper help then now I'm, you know I'm, I'm out of luck so definitely mm -hmm. definitely I, I feel where you're coming from it's definitely definitely a very true statement yeah man what happens to those guys they become leaders yeah. right <laughs> and so what do they do they they teach the same methods that they use how to mm -hmm. cope be resilient tough it up because otherwise there needs to be, they talk about reforming the police. Man, as a community, you got to take care of your cops too. You know, you got to take care of them. You got to take care of all your first responders. 
there needs to be no stigma against good counseling. There needs to be no stigma against talking about it because the science has shown that's how you process and deal with things. You know, we see that with our veterans, you know, PTSD, that stuff carries over to and, you know, applying it for first responders. And I think that the community itself needs to realize they have some responsibility too for policing themselves. I'll give you an example. And these, so these riots happen, right? What Saturday night, most of the riots started because there was the one that started in Minneapolis, but then it started spreading. Ours in Grand Rapids was on Saturday night. I'm talking not protests, but looting. And what I found was, is that that Sunday, all these videos came out about these looters and everybody started digesting that. Cult, the entire culture, like the whole system in the United States started digesting all this and everybody had different reactions. But a lot of people, especially the protesters, are like, this completely devalues the message we're trying to send. Right? So what happened on Monday is we started seeing more videos, but now the community started policing a lot of these looters. So they're finding these guys that are trying to break windows and trying to try. I saw this one video, this dude's like breaking up concrete to throw at cops and he gets tackled by protesters. Right. And then they bring him over to the police to go get arrested because they're like, no, we're not, we're not doing this today. It, it tears away from the actual message because there's people that are out for blood. There's people that just hate the institution and hate cops and just want violence. They lust after violence. And they're like, this, so they're trying to sow it. Um, so the communities, I think now Americans, they see these videos and they see it happen in their cities and they're facing an ugliness about themselves and a part of their society that we haven't seen before. It was always in the shadows and now it's in the light. The community themselves also has responsibility for their conduct and their actions of them and people around them. People around them. You can't just dump the entire burden of your city on the first responders. People need to step up to and that and it's all that's in all aspects of it. You need to be a proponent of good. You need to fight against bullying. You need to fight against, you know, if people are hurt, they get in a car accident, you got to stop and help them. You, you can't just keep driving. You have to stop people from looting. You have to stop people from hurting people. You have to, you have to shut down drug dealers, right? Meth, heroin, all that stuff. I mean, I work in hospital security and there's, when that stuff is evil, man, you know, people talk about drugs and I think most people like instantly traverse to marijuana because there's a big push for marijuana laws. I don't really care about marijuana. Personally, if I, if I had to fight a guy, I'd rather, if I was in a physical confrontation with a dude, I'd rather have to try and work with a person uh, that was high on marijuana than drunk. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever. I don't, I don't smoke weed. I don't get high. I've never been high. Um, but that is a far cry different than, and I'm not saying that it should be legal or not. I'm pretty apolitical about almost everything. I'm just saying from personal experience and my perspective, drug, like drugs are evil, man. And they're harder to police now because everybody's selling them online and through the dark web. So you gotta, you gotta, and if you're buying drugs, you're almost definitely funding some evil organization somewhere that oppresses and murders people. So the communities, I think, need to re also understand their ugliness and the ugliness in society and, and police it themselves as well and contribute to that. So that's definitely, definitely, that's definitely a big thing um, because, you know, everyone wants to point the finger at law enforcement and by no means am I defending um, what happened because it was completely wrong. He, the, you know, those four officers do deserve to be punished to the full extent of the law they, they do it was completely wrong um and that's coming from and that's not there's a lot of law enforcement officers who who agree um uh, almost all of them <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 the thing is is i think people like you said they kind of they need to 
it's not just a, a, a police thing. It's, you know, it, it, as a community, if you see a police officer committing an act that you know, I mean, without a doubt that it's wrong, then you should act on it. You know what I mean? Like, regardless if he's a police officer, he or she is a police officer, they're still doing wrong. They're still a human being, you know? And I, I think it, it comes back to, like you said, the community at that point, if no, if, if, if the, the, the officers on scene don't want to correct his, his, their, their, their battle or whatever, then it's up to the community, the people witnessing that this to step up, you know, they have to be that person. And, and it sucks because it puts you in a hard spot. It does because it's like, Oh, well, you know, that's, he's a law enforcement officer. I'm just a civilian. But at the, at the end of the day, are you going to let, you know, are you going to let that, you know, you're just going to sit there and watch it happen? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's just my take on it. I, I, I think that, that, that everybody, not just the community, everybody should kind of step back and, and look at themselves and be like, you know, this isn't really a left or a right thing or a Democrat or Republic thing or whatever conservative, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more, it's not a political thing. It's, it's, it's a, it's a human thing, uh, a person thing, problem. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to take accountability. Um, they just want to blame, 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 blame all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's one of the big things that I've learned, you know, in, in, in being in the military is you have to, uh, you have to take attack, ownership. Yeah. Ownership of your faults. You know, that's just, that's, it's a part of the game, you know? It is. It's that's what people say, right? They're like, it's really easy to say, "Hey, we need reform, and uh, we need to end racism." Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh yeah, that's. Yeah. I totally agree. That that <laughs> makes perfect sense. How do we actually do that? Mm -hmm. What are the What are the actions that we should be taking? Right. So I think that one is uh, the community needs to change their relationships with the police department. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to join the police in your city if everybody hates the police. Because exactly. you need to change your perception and your relationship with the police as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're going to get better quality police officers and better quality recruits if it, um, if it's considered something honorable, you know, and people yeah. hold it to a higher standard. Uh, maybe that's really hard to do if you have a really bad relationship with police officers. You know, mm -hmm. probably is probably is really really hard for you maybe there's things you could do maybe you could third ride with them i mean you're maybe, <laughs> maybe you could go see what it's like from their side of the thing man because it's crazy it's crazy out there so uh, actionable things that we can do um if you want to end racism make friends that are different than you mm -hmm. not just different skin color but like a different community and a different culture and have to find somebody really different than you. Yeah, right. Um, that's what I did. Brought my perspective, but, and, uh, people need to step up law enforcement reform. First, we need to, we need to value our first responders more and we need to provide more men resources for good mental health and inside those first responder cultures we need to change um, from a resilience mindset mm. to a reconstruction mindset right yeah because your mind is like a house and when you have these traumatic events like you can have a single one that's like a bulldozer and comes in or you can have some dude that comes in with a sledgehammer and makes a new hole every shift right yeah. so you have to learn and you could say resilience you're like oh it's cold outside uh, <laughs> but i'm just gonna suck it up you know because i'm tough Eventually, you don't. Your walls are all broken down. You're gonna die. You need to reconstruct because it's not gonna be the same mm. as it was before. That's why it's traumatic. Yeah, because the framework of your brain and how you perceive the world is ruined. The things that you've seen don't fit that anymore. They don't mm. fit what you thought about the world anymore. So your brain has to process it. That's why it's reconstruction. You rebuild it. I think in the future I'll I'll have on the podcast uh, a an associate of mine um who 
I'll, I'll ask him before I shout out his name, but well, I'll <laughs> see about getting an expert on here that I've, I've listened to his presentations and he talks about uh, traumatic rehabilitation and rebuilding and what it should actually be like for, you know, the warriors and uh, the medical personnel of our culture, um, what a good mindset is and how to actually be able to, to do the job as a career and you know, not get destroyed as a human being, but actually emerge stronger from all of yeah. your experiences. <laughs> <sighs> I'd say uh, that the other thing too is, is like, it's like you said, is, is people don't, and I, I hate to say this, but like, you know, kind of put it in, in our job in your perspective. Like if, if we're, if roles were to reverse, because I told myself all, all this, all the time when I'm out there patrolling, right. My, my ultimate goal is I want to get home safe to my family at the end of the night. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm not out there to entice violence or, you know, anything like that, but people got to understand that. So your people are probably going to scream police brutality all the time, no matter the circumstance. But until you've been put in, in that situation, you can't really call out police, police brutality unless it's like obvious, you know what I mean? Like the whole, you know, George Floyd thing was obvious, but people like to call out police brutality for, I mean, I've seen videos where like, you know, cops rightfully so, you know, throw a dude out of his car, you know, and, you know, subdue him or whatever. And people got to understand, like, at the end of the day, that's just, that's just officer safety. That's, I mean, a dude, and there, and like you said, there is evil out in the world. There is bad out in the world. There are people who do like to commit heinous crimes. All they want to do is cause havoc and kill. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and those people, they have to be dealt with a certain way. Um, I mean, fairly, yes, as a human being, but differently. Um, as to like someone who, you know, committed a, let's just say the difference. So say I was to roll up on somebody and somebody stole something, right? It was just a simple theft or whatever. Okay. You know, we talk, whatever, you know, you did wrong. I slapped the cuffs on you. You know, you do your time compared to a dude who's got like three felonies and they're all like big felonies, like, uh, domestic assault, uh, freaking assault on an LE officer with a deadly weapon. Um, just crazy, crazy, like rap sheet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At that point, like I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to subdue him a different way than I would the person who just like stole something that was of minor, you know, and nobody, nobody, I'll tell you right now, everybody thinks that cops are so like gung ho. That is not true. We do not like to draw our pistols. We do not like to, because every time we do that, there has to be, there is an investigation. So like here, for instance, um, every extremely time I have stressful. To, yeah. Every time I have to either draw my firearm or even if I draw my taser or my OC, I have to do a use of force statement. There's an investigation. They pull me off the road. Like it's, it's stressful. Like that's why we don't like to, because it involves a lot of paperwork and it's just, it's, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. And if you mess up, you can get fired. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're screwed. So, mm -hmm. so it's just, it's just one of those things where we don't, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that a lot of officers are, there are some out there who, you know, I've seen videos and they probably could have handled the situation a little bit better as far as, you know, not drawing their weapon or, you know, trying to defuse the situation with their, you know, their verbal techniques. Um, but there, there comes a point where like, that you know you got to do what you got to do yeah it's two sides isn't it it's two mm -hmm. sides it's like you know officer safety and you don't know until you've been in the situations like that and um but at the same time people talk the scream reform i don't i don't think they have any idea what they actually want <laughs> like <laughs> well how do you actually like administer that yeah what we need is a healthier police departments with a healthier culture Mm -hmm. and high quality people from the community staffing those positions. Mm -hmm. And the only way that that happens is when persons step up to do the job. Yeah. So I, I think that 
covers about everything, man. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, uh, a lot of crazy stuff. It's really impacted my perspective on a lot of things. The last mm-hmm. two weeks, last two weeks, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you this, my perspective on like community has changed a lot. Yeah. It wasn't, it was never like a really big thing for me. Cause I was like, Oh, you know, I'm Marine Corps. I went and you constantly travel. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I live where I live now and I live in a, like a suburban neighborhood offshoot from a, from a city. And I work yeah. downtown in the city. And, uh, I never really thought about community before, mm-hmm. but my mind is different now because it was the Sunday night after the riots in Grand Rapids. And there was a rumor that there was going to be rioting and looting along the business area of my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And that was the same night that Antifa got their Twitter taken down because they were doing posts inciting to go into white neighborhoods and assault white yeah. people and then assault white mm-hmm. families. And so that, that was all happening. And then there was rumors and reposts that there was, they were organizing to do violence in my neighborhood, like looting mm-hmm. and such. So, of course, like I kicked into work mode, right? So yeah. I got my I got my gear together. I got my gun yeah. together. I got all my tools. I set up. I got all my medical equipment up, and I set up like a little, like I'm like, what what is the worst case scenario? And I should probably be prepared for this. And mm-hmm. so I set up like a little aid station in the guest bedroom of the house. I got water and food, and I identified where it was and. You know, I just made a made a plan, just like you would if there was a tornado. Is the way that I saw it. I'm like, what makes me not crazy? Like, what's a healthy way to <laughs> to do this and not be like, and not be one of the boog boogaloo guys? You know. <laughs> so I, I viewed it as it's it's like being ready for a tornado. Like you would make mm-hmm. a plan with your neighbors. You get in your basement. You'd have, know where your food and water is. Same thing, except now it's possible armed violence in your community. Yeah. And, you know, I hearken to some things that I've learned before, but I've never actually had to put into practice, which is first, you be prepared to help yourself and your family. And the mm-hmm. second thing is, is that you have ex- excess skill and resources to be able to help those around you. And that's your community, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I called some friends of mine in the neighborhood, told them, hey, you know, this is the rumor. If it starts to feel not safe in your home come bunker up in my house and we'll keep each other safe. And then I went yeah. to my neighbors and they have babies. I told them the uh, same thing. I'm like, dude, you come over to my house. If it starts looking bad and we'll all stick yeah. together and help each other. And that is community too. knowing your neighbors. How many people don't talk to their neighbors? I mean, I don't really talk to my neighbors. I don't have a great relationship, but I should. Yeah. We used to. Mm-hmm. As Americans, we used to. We don't anymore. Maybe we should start there. If we want to change America, maybe we should start by being friends with our neighbors. Definitely. Sounds I good agree with that. Yeah. That whole experience changed a lot of my perspective on a lot of things. I've been unsafe before, but when it was <laughs> always me, it felt like an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. It was the mm-hmm. first time I had ever felt that my family was not safe in their own home. Yeah. I'm yeah. never going to forget what that felt like. And I'm sure many Americans felt that the last week. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Be prepared to help yourselves. Be prepared to help your neighbors. Yeah. I have a plan, definitely. Yep. Yeah. All right, Jacob. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate uh, your time. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, definitely uh, keep in touch. Yeah. Um, when you come back, when you come back to Michigan, we'll go to the gun range and oh, get some food man. and stuff. We'll do some training. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right. Thanks, bud. Yep. Take care. You too.